your brain, you're in the nuts domain. Come on in, it's about to begin. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Nerds Domain Podcast. This week, I'm talking to Marion G. Harmon, the writer of Wearing the Cape and the series that goes along with that. Say hi, Marion. Hello. So, uh, Marion, um, you've been uh, doing writing for, what, two years now? Is that right? Uh, seems like forever, actually, but I seriously started working on the first book in uh, 2009, 2010. Okay, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into writing? Um, uh, I know that you uh, you were a financial uh, advisor. How did how did you transi- transition from that into a full time writer? Uh, kind of unwillingly, actually. Um, I was uh, well. I don't know if you know much about Las Vegas, but it was one of the places that was really hit by the downturn in the housing market in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and that kind of impacted the entire economy, which kind of shot a hole in my practice. And uh, so I was actually asked to let go or asked to go by my home office for uh, not bringing in enough new new clients that year. And so, you know, I kind of found myself out there looking at the possibility of finding a job in a very bad job market. And I decided to take advantage of an opportunity that I had to work part time for one year and uh, just focus on actually writing, which was something I'd always wanted to do. I just thought I'd, you know, kind of semi-retire first and then do the fun stuff, which was the, you know, actually sitting down and putting together my books. So that's how it kind of started. Um, from there, really, the reason for my choice of, of uh, subject for wearing the cape was that was around the time that you remember that uh, Heroes came out on TV? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was a huge fan of the first season, but uh, the second season and thereafter, it kind of went downhill, and I had been kind of half expecting that after this great origin season, they were going to sort of morph into a real-world superhero setting, and that never really happened. It's very disappointing, and uh, right. so when I was thinking about this, I had my old comic book uh, you know, fandom on the brain, and I decided to try and actually do exactly that, a real-world superhero setting, by which I don't mean realistic powers. I mean realistic social and emotional response to having powers. And, uh, you know, how would the law treat it? How would we act if we had them and, and that kind of thing? So that's really kind of where it all started. All right. And so uh, how how long have you been into comic books? Is this a, like a childhood passion that's just grown with you? or? Well, it's uh, I collected huge as a kid and uh, even kept a few titles going when I you know graduated from high school and went off to college. And it kind of petered out after that, but I always kept my eye on the, you know, the evolutions of the Marvel and DC universe and my favorite characters in them. And uh, so, yeah, it's always been an interest that was on the back of my head. And then, of course, there were the superhero movies that were coming up as Marvel and DC were finally getting their acts together and, and actually uh, making, you know, fun superhero shows like the, the second Batman series. And then, of course, you know, uh, Thor, Captain America, the Avengers and so forth. So it was all there as part of the material in the back of my head. Okay, so um, you are self-published all through um, Kindle. Uh, that's at least that's where you got your, your start. Um, wh- what's it like to, to self-publish? How's that? Have you tried to publish through a full publisher, or is this where you started and it worked? Oh no, no, I'm, I'm not insane. I tried to actually uh, when I finished wearing the cape, the 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 uh, probably about the fourth draft, and I decided I had revised it as much as I could, and uh, I started looking for an agent and. Over the course of about six months, I sent out well over 100 um, query letters, actually, to different agencies. And the response I got back was was pretty much uh, either silence or there were a few that asked for some pages to look at. But um, they took a look at it and decided that they really couldn't represent me. And I like to tell myself it wasn't because of my writing, because a lot of people seem to enjoy it, but because um, superheroes are kind of a very interesting genre. They're not... uh, where would you put it on a bookstore shelf? It's not exactly fantasy. Yeah. It's not really science fiction. And the stuff that I write certainly isn't strictly young adult, although I've got a lot of young fans. So I think they might not have been able to sell it, or think they could anyway. And that's really what an a, uh, a, um, agent looks for, is when he's taking a book, on uh, a, a new client potential, uh, he wants to have something that he can get excited about number one, but also he can be pretty confident that he can take to a publishing house and say, look, this is a, you know, new example of this, you know, and, and label it specifically and the publisher will know what it is and know that they can spend some money on marketing and make their money back and, you know, 
you see where I'm going there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. So you um you you jumped into publishing through Kindle and they they have a uh at least from what I've seen, they've got a pretty easy self-publishing kit that they hand out. Um are you with a self-publishing group now? Is that what I I saw? Well, no, I, I actually wound up doing all that on my own, but I've gotten a lot of advice from people. Um, okay. The, the very first place that I looked was when I was polishing up my manuscript and still looking for a, a, um, a representation out there, an agent. I found a site that I highly recommend for new re- writers who want to get some good outside critiquing, and that either they don't have a local group they can go to, or they're very nervous about actually um, you know, putting it out there and talking to people and, and getting all that feedback. Um, I was very nervous about that. I, I don't do very well face-to-face when I'm discussing my own work. So there's a site that's based in England. It's called write on, uh, you write on. It's just all one word, youwriteon.com. And they have a kind of a round-robin competition system where you put the first 7,000 words of your book out there, and uh, then people critique it and rate it at the same time. And, of course, the ratings is a kind of a a competition, but the really important thing is the critiques that you get. And after the first couple of months of my book being on youwriteon.com, I actually pulled the first, well, 10,000 words and compressed things tremendously. And uh, it really made a difference in the writing. So that's the first thing is you've got to find a a source of that kind of criticism that really helps you kind of focus in on what you're doing good and what you're doing bad and what you can do better. Um, From there, it was basically just... You know, I, there's forums out there of people that have had experience on uh, going through um, Kindle and KDP, actually, Kindle Direct Publishing. And so almost every question you can think to ask has been answered, uh, especially on the KDP forums. So it's really just a matter of learning the material. And then, you know, you can either um, go ahead and apply it all the way through yourself, you know, trial and error, and it takes a little bit to get it right. Uh, or you can actually um, have well, specialized uh, help online. Well, they'll, they'll charge a bit to help you format the thing and, and take care of all that for you. Okay. And did you? Uh, how did you find an editor? Do you have one that you know, or did you find one through the Internet as well? Um, actually, for the first two books, my only editors were family. But I'm very, okay. I'm very fortunate there because my brother, um, he is one of these meticulous readers, and so he's the kind of person that I can hand a manuscript to, and he will find the grammatical errors or at least most of them. And uh, I've also got four sisters, <laughs> so I've got a large family, and all of them are avid readers, and all of them will read my stuff and tell me what they liked, what they didn't, and what you know they thought was going what. And uh, so that helped a lot. So that really has become my resource for yeah, all of my editing the, work. Yeah. That sounds like a great kind of, a great resource for just that support and, and that kind of critiquing where you know that they're, they're trying to help you move forward instead of just tearing you apart. Absolutely. Now, I did get a professional editor, um, basically a freelance editor for book three. And if you look inside the title cover, uh, actually, I don't think he's listed in there. Um, But I can get his name if you want. It starts with an M, and I never can remember what it is. (laughs) But he's very good. So I can get that back to you later. Oh, absolutely. Um, So you you said three books. Uh, What can you tell us about your books and the characters in them? Well, um... Obviously, they're superheroes mostly. Um, a lot of the minor characters, of course, in support, but the main character's name is Astra. And uh, I really patterned her after, if, if I was to give one word labels to all my characters, uh, At- Atlas would be Superman, uh, Astra would be Supergirl. I wasn't exactly going for really original um, power types when I was writing the book. I thought the main focus had to be on the characters and not on the, you know, woo, nifty, this is an interesting twist on a superpower. Well, and you, you grab hold of those archetypes real quick early on, yes. and you just accept them and move on. And I like that. That's, that's really, it's really nice to see you not focus so hard on making you know, the newest thing and just accepting what's already been out there for decades. Well, the important thing is all the groundwork has been done. I mean, I think almost every permutation of a superpower has been tried in the comics somewhere, especially oh, yeah. in like the X-Men you know, where they get very creative with all their different mutations. But when you're writing a book, the important thing, of course, is that the reader has to really identify with the character. And so that's got to be the focus. And I think that if you get too exotic too quickly, then that kind of takes the eye off the ball of what you're really trying to do is identify the reader with the situation as quickly as you can. And so using those kind of familiar archetypes really helps a lot. 
Okay, so you've got Astra as your as your main character, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sorry, Atlas as as her mentor. Yes. Um, what, what, who else? Because you, you spun off into uh, a story all about Artemis. <laughs> you know, I actually, I think I made a mistake in naming a lot of my characters with A's. <laughs> Just in the first book, there's Atlas, Astra, Ajax, and Artemis. And there's probably a lot of readers that get very confused about that. But uh, if you want to know about Artemis, she was supposed to be kind of a Batman type. Uh, not in powers, obviously, but in characterization. Uh, you know, the, the darkness to, to Hope Corrigan's light, if you will. And uh, she was so popular with the readers that uh, there was multiple requests for me to actually spin off a story for her. And I got excited thinking about her background and how she would act in a different situation. That was where, well, obviously the third book, um, Bite Me, came from. And and for our re- our listeners, uh, as- or Artemis is a vampire of sorts. Yes, of sorts. Everything is of sorts in this world. Absolutely. So, um, tell us kind of the background of the of the world. Uh, there was the event, mm-hmm. right? And and what all? How exactly did that work? That we're aware of, at least. Well, I've always sworn that I'm never going to tell what the event was, co- what the cause of the event was, um, and I actually have really kind of shied away from even thinking about the cause too closely because then I might, you know, slip it out to somebody, and then it's all right. over with. Um, I kept it mysterious for a reason, and that is that uh, really in the real world, there's so many things that happen that we're never, ever, ever going to know why. And oh, yeah. Sometimes the bigger the, the, bigger the, th- the thing, the, the less likely that we're ever going to really know for sure and with confidence. And so I wanted that to be kind of a theme from the very beginning. And so the event, basically everybody passed out for, for 3.2 seconds. The, the world lost electricity. Um, it all came back, obviously, very quickly, but uh, created a lot of disasters in the wake of that. And uh, then after that, it's still the same world that we always knew, but with one thing added, which, of course, is the you know, superhuman breakthroughs. And again, I also, whenever I talk about breakthroughs, power descriptions, I also go back to that theme of we don't know why they work this way. They often make absolutely no sense according to the laws of physics. In fact, most of the time they don't. They just do. We accept it, we categorize them, and we move on. Yeah. And there's been some explanation in your books, at least, on why people get certain powers. Like Astra was a very physical pushback kind of person in an emergency, so she got this this suite of powers, much like Superman. And and so there's other characters like that yeah. that have got... You, you explain at least, you know, this might be why, but we don't understand why or how, but this is... Why? Yes, there, there is a strong psychological link to either the situation or the personality of the person or both, uh, most often both. Um, I kind of stole that, actually. There's no such thing as the original idea, obviously. Um, I, I was a Wild Cards fan. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, that series of books. I can't say that I am, no. Well, George R. R. Martin, way back before he became known for Game of Thrones, uh, he wrote a – well, he was a, a co-writer and the anthology – anthology editor, I guess would be the best way to, to describe him, of a series of short stories um, set in what they called the wild card world. And ironically, this was actually based on the results of a role-playing game that a group of these writers uh, engaged in. I think it was in Arizona, but this was back in the 70s or so, so it was quite some time back. And the idea was that uh, some aliens uh, used the Earth as an experimental platform for an alien uh, gene rewriting virus that... Uh, if you got infected with what they call the wild card virus, there was a, a 9 out of 10 chance it was going to kill you because you were going to automatically mutate uh, completely lethally to you. Um, 1 out of 10 chance you'd survive, and there's about a 1 out of 100 chance that you'd not only survive, but you wouldn't be changed you know, to some grotesque form, but instead gain some nifty powers out of it. And uh, so that was the basis for a kind of a hard sci-fi real-world superhero story. And they linked the manifestation of the wild card virus in some ways, not only to the events, but to the psychology of the people who were uh, infected. And so that kind of, I think, was in the back of my head when I pulled this whole thing together. Okay. Yeah. I think so. there is one other thing, though, and that is that uh, you do have to have an excuse to explain why powers match the person, obvious. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so you've got... Um Four books out right now and a short story. Yes. That, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and you've expanded your the world out a little bit with some new characters in Chicago, which is where most of your stuff takes place, and then some stuff going on in New Orleans. Um, are we going to see more books following both lines of story? Are we going to get more? Are you going to go out into the world more and focus less on Astra and Artemis? What, what are the plans? Well, Bite Me is on the shelf right now. Uh, it, when I first did Bite Me, which the first one is Bite Me, of course, uh, Big Easy Nights is the full theme of the title. But uh, I kind of expected that I would alternate books on an annual basis. I would you know, spend six months and do a new Artemis story and then spend another six months and do another Astra story. And so it would be the Wearing the Cape series and the Bite Me series side by side. Okay. But uh, that's kind of fallen by the wayside because Bite Me has not done so well. <laughs> okay. um, I, I think mainly it's my writing. I, well, two things. One, I think that I didn't do as good a job on Bite Me as I did on Wearing the Cape. And I really just can't get away from that conclusion. But the other thing is that uh, it's a vampire book. And it's a va- sure, it's a vampire book set in a superhero world, but there's tons of vampire books out there already. Mm-hmm. So if you're interested in vampires, that might attract your attention, but probably not. If you're interested in superheroes, it's probably not going to attract your attention either, because, again, it's a vampire story. Okay. So um, you've got... The third book just came out, or the third book of the Wearing the Cape series just came out, Young Sentinels, yep. where you introduced the, um, what, three brand new characters? Four? Oh, let's see, is it four? Four brand new so, characters? Well, the, then you've got the regular, you know, non powered human characters. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. But you've got, yeah, you've got um, Megaton, Mal, then uh, there's Grendel, and Sir. Chris and Ozma. So those are yeah, those are the four new characters really. And and Ozma is, in my opinion, a lot of fun and very interesting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about her? Uh, I don't. I won't say go read the Oz books because I'm not using them as canon. And uh, to to be frank, I haven't read all that many of them myself. But um, I really I wanted to use her because the situation I had called for a new magic user. Now, I wanted to uh, bring in somebody permanent on the team that was a kind of a magic user along the lines of uh, Dr. Cornelius, if you'll recall, from... Uh, from Yeah, yeah. Yes, from the second book. Uh, and uh, But I wanted to give her her own magic system because the whole idea, of course, was everybody to some degree is you know completely unique, uh, especially the big uh, breakthroughs. And um, so I settled on her because... She was a lot more interesting than simply a uh, a kitchen witch, you know, <laughs> just yeah, a, a generic witch of some of some kind. And once I once I settled on her, uh, it started just kind of right itself because I did know something about the early Oz stories, and I mined some of that for some color background, and it just kind of took off from there. So she believes, and possibly is, the princess of Oz. Well, for a given value of is, because again, it's yeah. the the breakthrough universe, the the post you know post event world where everything is as it uh, appears to be, but not necessarily because it was that way ever to start with. <laughs> it's, it, it's real for a given value of real. Um, I think the question that I was kind of left on the shelf was, is she um, the projection of somebody else who really fanatically believed in the Oz stories and therefore created Oz, and she came out of that? which would be huge, obviously. Somebody's gone and yeah. created their own universe. Um, or, like you said, is, is she someone who is d- delusionally, she's had a psychotic break, basically, uh, that resulted in her breakthrough. And, uh, and therefore, she's somebody who was once Julie or Janet or, or, you know, or, or Melissa, Melissa and, and now she thinks she's Ozma. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, and there's always the third option where... Uh, because of the event, now Oz actually exists, and she can interact with it. And that's always possible, too. I mean, the, the event could simply have opened up bridges to worlds that were always there but never accessible. And I do like that that there's all this, this could happen or that might happen, we don't know. I, I really like that that aspect because it leaves a lot to my imagination, which means it runs wild and I make all these assumptions and then I have to go back and reread to make sure I actually read what I thought I read instead of what I wanted to read. Yes. Uh, my my but first real dip in that particular pond, of course, was Fisher back in Villain's Inc. Yeah, yeah. But there's so much that's available there that, that you're, you hint at and you say, well, something happened here, but you know, then you leave it alone. I, I really like that. So 
you've got another after Young Sentinels is is the plan your is your next book going to be another wearing the cape book? Yes, and it's provisionally anyway it's called Girls Night. And uh, okay. I've actually supplied a couple of hints online, so it's not giving anything away to say that at this point it looks like it's going to be taking place in Japan, uh, kind of a field trip that uh, that involves a- uh, Astra and Artemis and Shelley, of all people. Okay. And I'm not yet sure about the entire plot outline, so I won't go, won't go there yet, but uh, obviously since this is Japan, or the reason I chose Japan was because I wanted to take a chance to shine a light on another part of the post-event world. And uh, since breakthroughs are, are also, in addition to being shaped by char- your, your character and events, but also by your expectations, that means culture plays a large part in it, too. And so the Japanese culture, obviously, is very different. <laughs> and, their, yes. their, and their ideas of uh, heroic powers and, and myths and so forth are very different. And so you're probably going to see you know, mech warriors, magical girls, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, godlike martial artists, uh, you know, all those things that are tropes in anime and manga. And, uh, okay. you know, some, some of that kind of craziness mixed in. It's going to be a lot of fun. So um, after that, are we going to I, – I, I read that you have a sci-fi novel in the works. Are we going to get to see that anytime soon? Well, certainly not next year. Um, now, this actually – when I said I had novels in my head the whole time, this was one of them from way back. I was part of a Star Trek role-playing game group uh, when I was back in college, a very small group, and we had our own uh, bridge crew for a, a bridge that was, we called the, uh, well, actually it was the USS Delphi, or Delphinius, and uh, we had a lot of fun with that for a year or two at college, and then, of course, we tabled that when, when we all moved on, graduated, and so forth, mm-hmm. but uh, my best friend was one of those uh, members of the group, and she never let me forget about the characters, and we had a lot of fun with that. And so I started when I was first writing some story ideas. Um, I picked up this crew, and uh, they were really a, a radical and strange crew for Starfleet, I'll tell you that. I mean, we're talking about almost piratical. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and decided, well, why don't I file the serial numbers off and tell this really funny story with them? And uh, so that's where Worst Contact comes from. It's the idea that they are a... Uh, first contact crew, well, not exactly first contact. They're the uh, uh, deep space explorers, if that makes any sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The idea being that in this particular setting that I have, uh, the, human, the human race sends out deep space probes that are unmanned, and they, they kind of remotely survey solar systems. And ones that are provisionally interesting will get a follow-up deep space um, uh, group, uh, you know, explorers that go out there way beyond the local frontier and do a more thorough examination very quietly on the side. And then if they find anything really interesting, then you know they report back and, and a serious expedition is made. And so the Delphi crew is this small you know, deep space explorer group, and they make contact with the first non-human race uh, in human history. Okay. But, of course, this is called worst contact, not first contact. Uh, everything goes wrong. And the idea is it's just one thing after another. Um, in flavor, I'm kind of thinking like, have you read much by Terry Pratchett, Discworld? I have not, but one of our other um, one of our other writers has, and he loves it. Okay. The key to Terry Pratchett's humor is that the situation is often hysterically funny, but the characters are always deadly serious. The the humor, okay. the, or maybe it's the reverse actually. The the situation can be dangerous. But it's the character interaction and responses and so forth, you know, the idiosyncratic things that we do as human beings that gives rise to the humor. And uh, that's what worst contact is kind of. This is an increasingly nasty situation, but, you know, the, the dialogue, the, the interactions, the, you know, the, the bouncing of, of uh, you know, personality off personality and, and everything scrambling, uh, that's where the humor comes in. And so it's meant to be kind of a, a lighthearted space epic if there is such a thing. Okay. Um, so, talking about other projects, you just announced, uh, what, this earlier this week, um, your a new RPG of Wearing the Cape uh, for the Cortex Plus system that uh, Margaret Weiss Productions puts out. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and how, what the plans are and how, how soon we're going to get to see that? Okay, um... Well, it's still all up in the air. Um, I'm still seeking final approval for the open use of the license. And okay. the way it basically works is with an open license, uh, they have no trouble with somebody um, writing supplements for the Cortex system or you know, even basing entire um, campaigns off of them and so forth. 
Um, as long, but if you're going to sell it for money, then you have to have their approval. But because they're an open license, it's fairly easy to get their approval. They're still working on the details, but they want to be very open about it because they want to encourage, of course, development of the property. And uh, it's been equated with Savage, uh, Savage Lands. Is that? Uh, are you familiar with role-playing games much? Yes, uh, Savage Worlds. I Savage think Worlds. Okay, which is, again, it's a core system with an open license, and, and multiple companies have used that to develop particular game properties. And so the Cortex Plus system is very, um, it's very uh, stripped, is probably a good way to put it. Mm-hmm. A very simple and very easy to hack to your particular specifications. Uh, they have used it in the past for games like um, uh, Serenity was one of them, uh, Supernatural, Smallville. They like a lot of S's for some reason. But <laughs> yeah. uh, Leverage is another one. And the, the whole point is that they take media properties and they specifically tailor the Cortex system to best allow a role-playing experience like you would if you were watching an episode or taking part in an episode of Smallville, say, or Supernatural which, of course, are very different kinds of, uh, of experiences. And so because of that, it's very, very tailorable. And so they recently had had the Marvel line, which mm-hmm. – have you seen that, by the way? That was a very impressive – We've, we've actually played it um, shortly before we started our podcast. We played that and had a blast. Mm-hmm. So, what, what did you think was the funnest part of it? Um, it's um, – combat is very – descriptive and quick and you can you can have a lot of fun with it without it bogging you down in rules i think that's a big part of it yes no charts very few rules uh, a lot of strategy based around the proper use of the dice and therefore the embellishments you put on it and so forth is that about right that yeah yeah absolutely okay uh yeah they did a wonderful job i don't know if you're aware but they they won awards for both their core book and their first supplement which was the uh Mm -hmm. civil war in the same year uh, that Marvel decided they weren't making enough money on it and canceled their their use of the license. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was a really good system, and I think one of the keys, and this is important for like, especially with your world, mm-hmm. is that Hawkeye is just as important as the Hulk. It's not about well, Hawkeye could never fight the Hulk. It's about how does Hawkeye fight the Hulk, and it really um, keys into those individual characters and what they're good at, and and lets them shine in those ways. Yes. Now, obviously, again, taking it to wearing the cape, wearing the cape is a very different setting. I mean, if you look at Marvel and describe it, uh, you would describe it as highly cinematic, to say the least. Mm-hmm. Um, you would say that death almost never happens, <laughs> especially to yeah. lead characters. And if they do die, of course, they're probably going to come back in a while. Uh, so, you know, just be patient. Yeah. And your favorite character will, will return. Um, and there's not a whole lot of, um, although it's more socially realistic in the X-Men titles, for example, um, but there's not a whole lot of blowback from things like, you know, massive bit damage producing battles or so forth. Um, again, um, with like the X-Men titles accepted, and certainly the Civil War was an exception to that, where they set out to show a real social consequence to a superhero mm-hmm. battle gone bad. Okay. Uh, wearing the cape, on the other hand, from the very beginning, I decided it was going to be a very severe... Uh, very um, unforgiving real-world idea of if we had superhero battles in the real world, what would happen? And the answer was, if you were having serious fights, there would be a lot of heroes dying. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. There would be a lot of collateral damage, and it would certainly you know, not only shape the lives of the heroes, but everyone around them. And so when I sat down and looked at the Cortex system, the first thing I did was I decided, number one, it was going to have to be deadlier. And uh, so I'm including a few rules on that. I mean, it's going to be possible for someone to go from perfectly healthy to instantly dead in one hit in, in extreme cases. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also, there's, there's more granularity to it, which means in the Cortex system, there's basically three levels of superhuman. There's, you know, uh, you know just basically barely augmented, then pretty tough, and then godlike. <laughs> that about sums it up, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I decided I had to have a few more descriptive levels in there, so I, I've created what's called multi-dice. So it goes instead of from die 4 to die 12, it goes from die 4 to die 12 plus die 12, with, uh, okay. with uh, die 12 plus, you know, with basically doubling the number of dice that, uh, or levels of dice that can be involved in it. And uh, so, unfortunately, one thing that you just mentioned about Hawkeye being in this, on the same battlefield with the Hulk... Um, it, after I made all these changes, it looks like if there's a, an archer 
who gets in a fight with a Class A or that's involved in a fight somewhere around a Class A um, Ajax type, he's probably going to be either very nimble or very dead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> one, or, yeah. one or the other. So it's going to be an interesting experience. I'm, I'm very uh, um, not worried, but uh, intrigued to see what the playtesters are going to think of it. And and so far it looks exciting. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the Cortex system is really solid, and I think with the the changes you're describing, it really um, it's it's going to ramp it up into a, a grittier version, just like you're looking for, which makes it even more dangerous. Yes. But that that's that sounds great. Um, so will you be putting out a guide to the world with this? Because I know you've you've hit on a little bit of Hollywood, a little bit of Chicago, a little bit of New Orleans, and it sounds like Japan now. But I mean, New York and Memphis, Tennessee, and <laughs> Las Vegas. You've kind of left them a little open. And well, let me not, see. In, in really addition good. to the ones that you just mentioned, I've I've touched briefly upon super celebrities in Hollywood. Absolutely. Um, super cops in New York. And then yep. down in Texas, they get really scary, apparently. <laughs> well, and you've got the uh, cartel right across the border. That's right. Um, yeah, what I'm planning on doing, obviously, with the role-playing game is certainly, uh, in addition to the rules changes, I need to provide a solid briefing on the history of the world, everything that's happened since the event, or at least the major parts. Um, you know, a list of what's happened outside of, you know, in, in major countries outside of America, um, and obviously, you know, highlight different places and how they can, you know, run campaigns there and so forth and so on. So I think the answer to your question is yes. Uh, in the course of writing this RPG, I'm certainly going to be pulling together material of a source book type. And uh, I've been thinking, actually, about the possibility of in future books taking out, for people who don't want to buy the book, obviously, the role-playing game, um, you know, just taking uh, parts of this uh, of that project and putting them in the back of future books as appendices. Okay. So maybe that's yeah. just something as a treat for the fans. Excellent. So, um, sounds like you've got a lot of stuff kind of lined up and working towards. Um, you said uh, a book twice a year. Is that what I was understanding? That's my goal. It's every six months. Okay. Um, do you have any specific advice if there's a, a writer or someone who aspires to be a writer who's listening right now about anything, self-publishing, writing superhero books, just anything. Oh wow! What would you What would you suggest? Uh, boy, there's too many things to touch on. Really, I'd say find as many books on writing as you can. Um, there's tons of good ones out there by both longtime writers and people who've been, you know, writers slash editors slash agents for years, and uh, they can always offer you good advice. You know, you, you you pick and choose what you want, but the idea is get out there and and uh, you know find out what has worked for other people. Uh, second thing is adopt a system. You know, write every day. Whatever works for you. Um, another thing is finish what you write. I mean, one of the main reasons why I went ahead and, and self-published Wearing the Cape was not just because I couldn't find a publisher, but because I wanted to stop writing it. <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't. I know some people can just go ahead and finish a manuscript and say, it's as good as it's going to get. I'm going to put it aside now. I found I couldn't really do that with my first book. And since I wasn't getting an agent who was going to say, now it's done, we're giving it to an editor, um, I put it out there so I'd stop writing it myself. That sounds like a plan, yeah? Yeah, people shouldn't probably be that extreme as a way of stopping, but that's what worked for me. Um, I'd say probably the main advice that I would give, if it's just one thing, is that uh, you better write what you enjoy writing because if you get good at it and you start getting paid, you're going to get stuck with it. And you, and you don't okay. want to burn out. I mean, the uh, famous story, of course, of Sherlock Holmes is Arthur Conan Doyle got sick and tired of him, and that's why he threw him off Reichenbach Back Falls. And, yeah. uh, and even that didn't stick because the fans objected so much, he had to bring them back. But uh, he was done with Holmes long time before all the readers were. So, uh, so that would be it. You know, write what you enjoy, and, uh, and you'll have a much longer career. Okay. Um, so it looks like um, all of your books are available on Amazon. Um, looks like seven ninety nine for um, most of these, for the Kindle edition. So Wearing the Cape, um, and then Villains of Ink, and Young Sentinels and Bite Me, and then you have a short story called Omega Knight, which takes place between um, Villains, Inc. and Young Sentinels. Yes. Um, you can also, it looks like you can get everything except for the short story and paperback for um, between 11 and $13, give or take. Um, 
I really suggest to our listeners that they they check out this the writing. Um, this is one of the books that I've actually gone back and read and read. Um, and this is one of the series that when the books come out, I get excited. You were releasing these originally in like four parts for Wearing the Cape and Villains, Inc. Well, actually, that was an experiment only for Villains, Inc. Oh, was it? Yes. And I, okay. I kind of abandoned that one because although it really helped me help my held my nose to the grindstone that I had to have a new quarter of the book out every two months. But, okay. Uh, I decided to go away from that after that, so it's not going to happen again. Okay. But you, uh, the, all these books are are good reading. Um, I wouldn't say they're they're definitely not adult books. I wouldn't necessarily call them young adult books either. I mean, they, there's there's plenty of themes there and pr- plenty of the the growing up and learning aspect that that young adults could grasp hold of and and really identify with. But I think there's plenty there for you know people my age and I'm I'm in my 30s so. Um, I think there's plenty there for anybody that has any kind of interest in comic books at all, and superheroes from you know front to back, anywhere in there can can get something out of this. I have had fans write in from 14 to 50. Oh, right on. So look, everybody can get a hold of it, and none of it. I haven't read anything that that made me think, "Ooh, my son should probably not read this," and he's nine, so I think he'll do all right with them. Um, uh, is there anything else that you want to uh, talk about or plug before we wrap this up? No, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, I would say this. There is something coming out with Amazon that people should probably be aware of if they haven't bought either of the books yet. Uh, they've got something called Matchbook, which is coming up soon. And what that means is that uh, if you have bought a paperback through Amazon of my book, then you can also turn around and buy the ebook for your computer or your Kindle or, or whatever your reader is uh, for three ninety nine. Ooh. Yes. Okay. And so that's a good way for someone who likes to have the paperback book on their shelves, but also wants you know the convenience of reading it wherever they want to, uh, to have their cake and eat it too for an extra three bucks. Okay. Um, so uh, it sounds like uh, check you write on dot com. Uh, it's the word you. I made the mistake of using the letter, but uh, if you guys if for as a resource for. Um, critiquing and and that kind of thing. Um, We can find you over at Goodreads, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, do you have a Facebook or a Twitter to go along with this? I don't have a Facebook really active for wearing the cape yet. I am putting together a new and updated computer site for all of my wearing the cape stuff. Okay. And when I do that, I'm going to probably going to link a a new and, and buffed up Facebook page to it, too. Okay. And you're at... MarianHarman.com, is that right? That's right. It's one of the okay. uh, uh, WordPress uh, WordPress sites, but it's MarianHarman.com, yeah. Okay, and um, I think that'll do us tonight for uh, Nerds Domain Presents, or Nerds Domain Podcast. Uh, you can check out our Facebook and our Twitter. You can head over to iTunes and give us a rating, and you can head over to Slash Loot and uh, check out our shirts and buy some. And we will talk to you guys real soon. <laughs>